Go. Okay, James Powers, thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead now and continue with the late 40s. Now, lest you think that designers just harken back to the years before the war, they did develop kind of their own motifs also. This was a part of that, you know, Pacific Island type of uh, Polynesia, etc. theme that was so popular after the war. And uh, this I picked up, uh, I think, at a thrift store. And this is uh, a true love cravat. Um, it was sold, I forget where, I can't remember. Originally it says something here, but anyway, the point is, this has got a great motif on it, bamboo with leaves, and this is something that was quite popular. Palm trees were also popular, and at least I, I forget, ties were available almost everywhere. You could go into J.C. Penney's, you could go into Harrison Frank, uh, you could go into Haber, Men's Haberdashery, they were available just about everywhere. As I think uh, Justin mentioned, I mean, they started cranking them out. Uh, you know, by the millions, literally by the millions. Let me say this too, contrary to what you might think, it was not men who made up the, uh, the majority of the Thai buying population, it was females. They did studies in the back of the late fours and found that women bought, I think, something like 75% of all the ties. They bought from their husbands and boyfriends, obviously. Here's another design, and this is part of Cheney's Game Birds. American Game Bird series, which came out in the late 40s. Uh, again, the length is probably about 50, the width about maybe uh, three and a quarter. But this is definitely late 40s, and it's a great tie. Again, picking this up at a thrift store for about two dollars. If you look closely, you can see the Game Birds inside here, perhaps even right here. And it's a fairly loud tie. We think about the late 60s, 70s being the loud tie period. Well, you ain't seen nothing yet. Again, after the war, Yes, extremely expressive and loud ties. Then, we've got something like this. This is called You Can't Tell a Book by Its Cover. And this was originally sold in Bullock's, Los Angeles, which no longer exists. And it's got some great library themes. If you're into uh, librarians or if you're a librarian, you might want to get one like this. And this feels like it's real. After World War II, a lot of times were made out of rayon, wool, cotton. As I mentioned before, around 1950, they started with acetate, then acetate rayon. Now, I've also got a couple of examples of hand-painted. This one right here is hand-painted in California. I think most of the hand-painted ties were. Some artwork was done with an airbrush. Some, of course, is done by hand. This looks like mostly an airbrush. And, of course, the design continues over here to a certain extent. Okay? Pretty uh, loud tie. Also, uh, I've got this one here. This was, this is an original Michele, handcrafted in California, pure silk. Silk has always been valued for its texture. And at the time, a pure silk t uh, tie in the late 40s, early 50s, would average you probably about three dollars more or less like that. I've got two more. Should have put them in front of me in the first place. Another loud tie. This is from Windsor of California, again hand painted. I've worn this once or twice. Bright uh, lavender and purple. What, those colors. What's the width on that? That one the looks width really on this long. This is probably John close to five, don't you think? Yeah, it's pretty that's close really to five long. Inches. This is about the widest it got during that time period. The 70s got even wider. Uh, but yeah, it's about five inches, John. This belongs to uh, Justin. Uh, no label, I don't think, on it, right? But very nice. Very nice design. I thought almost Japanese when I first saw because of the archway. But it's hand-painted. In fact, it says in the back, like a lot of them do, hand-painted. You can see that. John likes that. And what I like on these is that they would go ahead and usually have this type of concentration of paint on the back in concordance with this right here. So, yeah, kind of something different. But this is not a planned knot tie. In other words, when you put this on, this would not have been on the knot. Probably not. Probably not. No, no pun intended. Okay. But anyway, very interesting. Of course, again, this is from Justin. All right, having said that, I'm going to go ahead and segue back to Justin. Thank you. Go. Yeah. Seeing as how we've gone into some loud uh, uh, ties and ideas about that, 
Um, we come with, uh, away with a tie from the 30s, a uh, Pomeroy, I think it's sold in Pomeroy, the Sonata, uh, tied, painted by hand, patented, and it looks a lot like the end papers of a fine book that you used to get, and um, it, they had a lot of, the, uh, of, of this available, not many of it have, have you seen and will see yet, uh, and then survive. Uh, it wasn't only a single thing that, that started in the 30s and stayed there. There's another one, which is a little later, different material, probably uh, satin, crayon, a nice, nice material. This is not lined as well, but it went even probably as far into the 40s and early 50s with this width, this pattern, still the same, probably the same kind of uh, rayon acetate blend. The feeling's a little bit different on this one. This one's lined, and we have who it is from Cardinal Custom Neckwear. Uh, Lee contributed this one, and it's a fine example of what was being done through all the time. Uh, yeah. Even some of the whim whimsical things that were being done, like this tie here, probably from about 48 or so, uh, it's interestingly titled, Like Water Off a Duck's Back. You've got the ho hose and the shower head spraying on the duck, and, and it's, it's not particularly loud. It's probably something you could get away with wearing to the office, and no one would know that it's really quite whimsical and interesting, uh, which kind of runs us into yeah. further kinds of 50s examples for another contrast, another minimalist tie, squares, very straight, very uh, understated, not necessarily lined, it was quite common for the Resisto brand, uh, and it, it, even as time went on, Resisto and Wembley were quite popular with things like wear with blue suit and other suggestions that still carry through today for Wembley ties. We'll have a suggestion that says what to wear with. And it also was kind of a, a thing for the, the 40s through 50s that, that not only did women buy the ties, but a lot of famous uh, women were actually designing them as well. Tina Lesser, uh, Schiaparelli, and others were actually uh, moving from their designing for women to designing for women, men's ties. And women right away would understand completely and identify with a brand name that they had bought with their clothes. So it was a crossover that really helped and would make it quite an, an interesting uh, array for uh, the women of the day. So not only so we have women designing the ties, women buying the ties for the men, and men just wearing the tie. So it would be completely understandable for the woman to tell you how, what to wear it with. <laughs> and as that goes, uh, ties are a culture all their own. Uh, later on, we find that after the 60s and 50s where the tie just got so thin and so uh, completely uh, bland that you had the peacock look with the 70s where the ties just blew up and color blew up on the ties. These, these small tie-dye examples are nothing in comparison to what came further. It was just outrageous. Uh, and Again, as time went along, the ties got became more conservative. In the 80s, you'll find people like Pierre Cardin and Christian Dior and other things that women relate to the names, uh, making ties that, that were um, more sedate. You'd find more stripes and, and much less patterns. And uh, into the 90s and such, it became a little bit looser, but uh, we'll get to that later.
All right. All right. Thanks a lot, Justin. Uh, before we go into the transition period, which is basically 1953, 54.